Hi everyone, I'm Ozan and this is joint work with Claire Cardi and today I'm going to talk about opinion mining with deep recurrent neural networks. Um, fine grain opinion analysis aims to detect subjectivity in text and characterize certain aspects of it um, such as intensity, whether it's strong or weak or polarity or sentiment, whether it's positive or negative or neutral. Uh, holder of the opinion, target of the opinion, or the opinion topic. This sort of fine grain analysis is important for a variety of NLP tasks such as opinion oriented question answering or opinion summarization. <coughs> In this work we focus on detecting opinion expressions only and in particular two kinds of opinion expressions the direct subjective expressions and expressive subjective expressions. So DSCs are explicit mentions of private states or speech events um, conveying private states. Um, so you can think of DSCs as, as like obvious and direct ways of conveying attitude or sentiment. And ESCs are expressions that indicate emotion or attitude um, in an implicit manner, um, so they are more indirect. So to make things clear, we have this example sentence. So the committee, as usual, has refused to make any statements. So in this sentence, has, the phrase has refused to make any statements is a DSE because it directly conveys uh, an attitude. And as usual is an ESE because it imp it implicitly conveys um, a sentiment from the author of the sentence toward the committee. Um, since later we're going to adopt a token level sequential prediction approach, we have to convert the phrase level um, labels to token level labels and we do that using the BIO schemes which stands beginning inside and outside. So every phrase label is converted to a sequence of token labels starting with the B tag and continuing with the I tag and everything else is just outside. So most earlier work that attacked this problem formulated it as a token level se sequence labeling or tagging problem. Um, so with with this idea, conditional random fields have been applied to these tasks. And there are other approaches that try to jointly detect the opinion holder along with the opinion expressions. Um, there are re-ranking approaches that try to improve the performance of a single sequence labeler. Um, and more recently, there are semi-Markov conditional random fields which can operate at the phrase level and hence incorporate phrase level features uh, have been successfully applied to this task. Uh, the issue with all of these previous approaches is that their performances, uh, performance critically depends on having access to a good feature set typically coming from uh, dependency or constituency, parse trees, manually curated opinion or subjectivity lexicons, named entity taggers, part of speech taggers, and other pre-processing components. So in the end, it, uh, it all comes down to um, good feature designing and engineering. So in this work, the main question we ask is whether it's possible to achieve comparable or even better performance using a feature learning based approach rather than feature engineering. Um, to this end, we adopt the same token level sequential prediction approach. So every sentence is a sequence of tokens. And as a sequence labeler, instead of using CRFs, we use the bidirectional recurrent neural networks, which uh, can extract um, hidden information of, of sequential input. 
In our case, recurrent neural nets have access to only a single feature source, and that is the pre-trained word vectors, which are themselves trained in an unsupervised fashion. So the only human intervention occurs at the uh, labeling of the supervised data of the task, not in the feature designing stage. Um, so recurrent neural network is basically a neural network that is capable of processing sequences of vectors. So X here is, a, is the input sequence, in our case, uh, uh, word vectors representing the sequence of tokens in a sentence. Y is the output labels, so beginning inside or outside. And H is the hidden layer or memory layer which uh, represents the extracted features. So the way to compute this memory is that at every time step it is a nonlinear transformation of the past memory and the current input. So another way to think of this is that you have a running, uh, running memory state representation which you update every time step with the new input. And then finally you make a final decision based on this hidden representation. Uh, so essentially this vector h uh, at any time step summarizes what you have seen so far in the sentence. With this definition, uh, one thing to notice is that when we're making a decision on a token, we don't have any information about the future, the succeeding set of words, which is too limiting for most NLP tasks. And to work around that, we use the bidirectional recurrent neural net, which has two uh, memory representations, um, forward and backward memory, which go from left to right and right to left, respectively. Um, essentially, the forward memory is a summary of the past and backward memory is the summary of the future. So both of them together is a summary of the whole sentence with a focus around the current token. And based on these two informations, we make a final decision. Finally, we um, stack such bidirectional recurrent layers on top of each other to construct a deep bidirectional RNN. Um, so intuitively what happens is that every, you can think of every memory layer as a separate uh, intermediate processing step. So it, it takes an input sequence and does a nonlinear processing on it and generates an intermediate representation, which is then passed to the next layer for further processing. So these kinds of uh, networks have been shown to outperform uh, shallow RNNs in a variety of tasks. It's also empirically shown that uh, different memory layers operate at, the, at different time scales. So higher layers uh, capture longer term dependencies. Um, we train such uh, neural networks as follows. So we use softmax and rectifier nonlinearities for output and hidden representations. We use dropout regularization in which uh, you drop uh, units from the memory layer with certain probability on, uh, on every input instance. We use stochastic gradient descent with classical momentum uh, with a cross-entropy based classification objective. Uh, we employ early stopping, so out of all iterations we pick the best performing model on the development set. We don't employ any layer-wise pre-training of the RNN. We also don't fine-tune the pre-trained word vectors, so they're held fixed during the training. This is done to reduce complexity. And finally, we have two parameter sizes, and for each of those, when we increase the depth of the RNN, we shrink the width, the number of hidden units in a single memory layer, so that the overall uh, number of parameters stays constant. Um, we use the MPQA 1.2 corpus as our data set, which consists of 535 uh, news articles with manually annotated uh, DSE and ESE tags. 
As in previous work, we separate um, 135 of them as the development set in which we do model selection and do a tenfold CV on the remaining 400. Since detecting the exact boundaries of, of phrases is difficult even for human annotators, we have two um, softer accuracy measures. Um, in, in binary overlap, every overlapping match between a true and a predicted phrase is considered to be correct. And in proportional overlap, every such match is every such match contributes to the correctness partially proportional to the overlapping amount. So it's a number between zero and one. And in this case, binary overlap is the easier, more lenient metric. And after defining these two accuracy measures, we can define binary and proportional precision recall and F score over these measures uh, to measure performance. So before doing the experiments, we hypothesized that uh, deep RNNs would outperform shallow RNNs. Um, in, I mean, based on the previous results on, the, on different tasks. And we thought that this would be especially visible on ESE detection because ESEs uh, are more difficult than DSEs in the sense that they can uh, involve phrases or terms that in most contexts don't have any sentiment or attitude, so you have to get a good grasp of the concept around the phrase to actually notice if, it's a, if it conveys an opinion or not. Um, how RNNs would compare against the CRF or semi-Markov CRF was unclear, especially uh, when CRFs have also access to pre-trained word vectors in addition to all the other feature sets. So this first result um, compares uh, various deep and shallow RNNs of various size and depth. Uh, so as you can see in both DSC and ESC extraction, three-layer RNN with the larger size uh, performs the best. And the difference between the three-layer RNN and, and the shallow one-layer RNN is significant. Also, it looks like there's a general trend of increasing performance as you increase the depth until a certain depth after which uh, the performance starts to decrease. Um, this these second set of results compare deep RNNs to previous baselines. So CRF and SCRF here denote the plain CRF and semi-Markov CRF. And the plus sign means that they have access to the word vectors, pre-trained word vectors, as, as a set of features in addition to the other feature sets. Um, as you can see, in both DSC and ESC extraction, with respect to the proportional F measure, deep RNN outperforms all the other baselines. Um, and the difference between deep RNN and all the others is significant. In the binary metric, sem the difference between semi-CRF and deep RNN is not significant, so they perform equally well. But note that the proportional metric is the more difficult one. And also there's an interesting artifact uh, when semi-CRFs have access to additional features. Um, so the reason for that is their precision increases, but their recall drops, so they become more conservative. And this causes an overall drop in the F measure with the extra features. So this is an example uh, showing some, some results over the three models. And this sentence has two opinion expressions. And both deep RNN and shallow RNN seems to capture parts of the subjectivity. 
Deep RNN seemed to do better with respect to the actual phrase boundaries. And semi-CRF labels almost the entire sentence as an opinion expression, which is bad in terms of, of precision in this case. In this second example, again, we have two opinion expressions. Deep RNN captures both of them, one of them partially, the other entirely correct. Um, shallow RNN captures one of them, sort of, and misses the other entirely. And in this case, semi-CRF misses all of them entirely. <clears throat> um, this final set of examples compared deep RNNs to shallow, shallow RNNs. And it, in the, if you look at the first example, it, it looks like both deep RNNs and shallow RNNs are able to capture parts of the subjectivity, but it looks like deep RNN improves the phrase boundaries uh, compared to shallow RNNs. And in the second example, something similar occurs. So shallow RNN misses uh, one of the opinion expressions, and deep RNN captures them, also improves uh, the other's phrase boundaries. So in conclusion, um, deep recurrent nets perform better than shallow RNNs of the same size in both the ESC and ESC extraction tasks. Um, it looks like from the exploratory analysis, uh, both deep and shallow RNNs are able to capture parts of the subjectivity, but deep RNNs seem to do better on handling the exact phrase boundaries. Also, we finally showed that uh, deep RNNs outperform all the previous uh, CRF and semi-CRF uh, based baselines without having access to constituency or dependency trees or opinion lexicons or uh, part of speech tags or any other uh, pre-processed features. This is the case even when the CRF and semi-CRF has access to word vectors, in which case the CRFs have access to a strict superset of the features that the uh, deep RNNs have access to. So this shows that a, a feature learning based approach for the, this task is, is feasible and indeed it works well. Thank you. Uh, questions? So the semi-supervised uh, semi, uh, mark, mark for model, they, they can define the features over their phrases. Yes. So uh, I, I may, may miss that. Do you, is there a feature site for this semi-mark for CRFS the same as uh, deep, the deep neural network? Um, sorry. The feature set you use is same as, is the same for both cases? Uh, with deep RNNs? So they yeah. have access to more features. So because the segmentation is also part of the problem, uh, semi-CRFs need to generate candidate segments over the sentence, and that's why they need access to constituency trees of the sentence, and they also have access to other lexicons over the uh, phrase space that denote whether, like... Yeah, that's my question. So if you, if, because if you define phrase level to features within the semi mark for model, so is it it's if your training data or your data set is too small, maybe the feature set may be small, the features, the features may be too sparse. So do you have some comments on that? Um, you might be right. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I, I never looked into whether the like, feature sets are sparse or dense in the case with CRF. <laughs> So if you use dropout in the recurrent hidden states, what I feel is that the amount of the information flowing from the, uh, let's say, previous times that decays exponentially. So it might actually be that you just, if you just use, let's say, 
few words, window, and then feed for net, it's going to work as well as the deep RNN. What do you think? I'm sorry, with dropout and feed for neural nets, did you ask? If you use dropout, yes. the amount of information flowing yep. across the time will decay exponentially, right? Mm -hmm. So. Oh, it's, well, I, I mean, in our case, we share the dropped units across time. Oh, okay. So okay. if you, like, you always throw the same units uh, ah, in a single sentence. All the, okay, instance. All right, thanks. So when you say you give the, uh, the CRF and semi-CRF access to the word vector features, do you add them as the just unigram features or actually the model can learn the um, combination between the word, uh, word vector values and the other uh, discrete um, lexical features? So. I mean, they have access to both of them. So when we give them access to word vectors, they still have access to like unigram type of features. Um, I mean, in the case of CRFs, I'm, I'm not sure if they're able to capture that kind of relationship. <laughs> Because it like semi CRF is affected by it in the sense that it becomes more conservative and like it doesn't tend to produce an output for most uh, phrases. Um. I think by default you don't have conjunctive feature because of that. Yeah, so they're probably separate. Yeah. So uh, I, I would like to add one question. Um, so this paper you actually just. Um, kind of compare in this opinion mining task uh, um, with you know, comparing recurrent neural network with CRF. Mm -hmm. um, so you got fantastic result. And I'm just wondering if this conclusion is kind of general. So you know, CRF has been applied to many other sequence labeling tasks. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't have a definitive answer to that. And I mean, in, in this case, it's also a bit like un unclear why deep RNN is better than CRFs, um, and we ask the same question, but we don't have a definitive answer. One speculation that we make is that when you go from a shallow RNN to a deep RNN, uh, because of this, this multi-layer different time scale capability of, of deep RNNs, it might be the case that even though it's a token level approach, uh, it may behave like more like a phrase level approach because the lower layers would capture shorter term dependencies and higher layers would capture the interphrase relationships. Um, and that would be similar to making a transition from a plain CRF to a segment level semi Markov CRF. But that only explains why uh, deep is better than shallow, but it doesn't compare why it performs against CRFs. All right, let's thank the speaker again.